I like your hat. I like your hat. Speak up. I like your hat. Nope. Lifesaver. I like the shirt too, see? <laughs> All right, so let's go do some brain questions. You guys have a sheet of paper? Mm-hmm. Good. Number one. Hmm. What is this lobe here called in the front? Number one. Number two. What is the lobe called all the way in the back? Number three. What is this specific red gyrus called? Let me know if I go too fast, okay? Hi, Marcella. Hi. I got the little list too, you're good. Number four, yeah, just chip, chip in with the, the quizzy. So number three yeah. was this weird. Number four is going to be this brain in the back of the brain, the small little brain in the back of the brain. This brain is from the back side. So it's, it's right here on the bottom. Um, it's also visualized right here. What's that brain called? That's number four. I know I gotta get better pictures for that. <clears throat> number five. What should I find for number five? Okay, so this here is the whole thing is a brain stem. All right. And I want to know the middle section of the brain stem. That's number five. The middle section of the brain stem. I know these might be a little bit hard, but we'll get through better and better at it. And I'll find better pictures too. And then number six, I like you to tell me what's the lobe called that's called the hidden lobe. the hidden lobe. And I think that's good enough. All right. Number one, what do you have? Anybody? Frontal lobe. Good. Number two. Is that the occipital lobe? Occipital. Good. Number three. Is that the motor cort? No, never mind. Is it cortex? Yeah, which one? Give uh, the red one. Yeah, I know. Oh, the so, motor Nate? cortex, right? Yeah, it is a cortex, but which which one do I want? Girl. Is it parietal? Precentral? Um, yes, precentral gyrus. See it on the list? Sure. Johanna, see it on the list? I don't have my list, that's why. Ah, uh, that's the thing. You go get list. <laughs> uh, well, you'll get it next time. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you guys bring the list to the computer when we do this stuff. Number four. Anybody? Is it the... Uh, Hello? Only one I didn't know. <laughs> that's okay. Somebody say it. <laughs> It's the hind brain. It's the cauliflower brain. Any ideas? Is it cer cerebellum? Yes, it's cerebellum. Perfect. Good job, Carlos. And then number five. I had that's that's here in the front, right in the front Pro of the cerebellum. Professor, what was number three again? Precentral gyrus. Oh, okay, got it. You you had the cortex right. It's just on the list. I was looking for the anatomical structure and what's in it is the pre is the motor cortex. Oh, okay. So you're definitely on the right, totally on the right play. If you have to list in front of you, you would pick the right one. And, and yours is not necessarily wrong. I was just going for the specific one on the list. Um, okay. What was the last, the next one, the five? 
in Sula? No. That's number six. So let's do that. Number six is in Sula. Oh, sorry. I thought you said the last one. No, that's oh, all right. That's all right. Uh, number five. So you got in Sula. That's number six. What was number five? You also know that, Kirsty? Is it the ponds? Yes, it's the ponds. Perfect. That was a little harder. All right. So the same rules apply. One person says an answer, then they got to be quiet till we open it up for everybody's round two. Okay? Got it. As we have learned, the brain is our main neural integration center where many of the sensory pathways end and motor ones start. The spinal cord has some rudimentary integration, as we will see when we discuss reflexes, but for a large part, it carries ascending and descending neurofiber tracks. Those nerve fibers then travel through 31 spinal nerve nerves to their entire to the entire body. In the cervical and lumbar region, the th the cord thickens. What do we call the thickening in the neck? Cervical, cervical enlargement. enlargement. <laughs> Good. One more time. Who's first? Cervical, cervical enlargement, Marisol. There you go. Bing. That was it. So that's just an anatomical piece of the situation let me i put to... that in and i and then i got that question wrong you did yeah it okay. may have been my spelling but i did put that in and the answer came back wrong okay i took an old ebony i'll look it up afterwards and and okay. we can we can shoot takes back and forth or even just stay after the lecture if you want real quick okay uh, thank make you. sure about that okay uh, you. yeah so that's just because we have extremities we have upper extremities and then we have lower extremities so in where the nerves bunch up together in the cervical and in the lumbar area, there's just more cell bodies in that area. So we need more action. And so, uh, you know, more reflexes and all that stuff. And so this becomes a little thicker in that area. So that's about that. Number two, looking at the cord lengthwise, it starts where the medulla oblongata ends, which is around the foramen magnum. It then travels through the spinal canal all the way down to L2 or L1 or L2 where it closes to a tip. It doesn't go all the way to the coccyx or tailbone because when the spine grows, uh, the bone grows more than the cord. So the, the, the bony elements grow for, faster than the neural elements or more so. Uh, what do we call the tip call, uh, where the spinal cord ends? What is that called? Conus medullaris. Conus medullaris. You're on it, right? Yes. Good. Again, just another anatomical structure. If nobody has a question about it, we'll move to the next question. Just raise your voice if you're not clear about anything we talked about so far. And we look at it. Uh, number three, below it, nerve roots travel freely before they exit the inner vertebral foramen or the sacral foramen at the appropriate levels. What are those nerve roots collectively called? The Equina. Cauda Equina, who's that? Kirsty. Kirsty. Oh, good. The horse's tail. Very nice word. So just anatomical structures again. Uh, and again, if you questions, to speak up when we look at the slides. Uh, when we follow a spinal nerve back through the intervertebral or the sacral foramen or towards the spinal cord, we find uh, it split right after entering one arm or nerve root reaching around the cord entering in the front or anterior or ventral um, and the other swell, swelling up a little before entering into the back or the posterior dorsal side. Spinal nerves are made up of both sensory and motor nerve fibers. Nerve roots can only carry either um, uh, sensory or motor nerve roots. Do the ventral nerve roots carry sensor or motor fibers? Motor? Motor nerves. The ventral, yes. Alice, right? Yeah. Hey, Dennis, how are you? I'm good, and you? Good, 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 good. Make sure you stay after class. I don't, I mean, to so make sure everything's cool. Alice, where is my Alice here? Hold on, let me find Alice. Oh, there you are. Good. So did everybody understand? Let me go to that slide real quick. That's a little bit more tricky, maybe, for some of you. So, okay, so we have the enlargements, and then we have the caudal equino, it's the horse's tail, and the conus medullaris right here. 
And then um, and then we get into wait, where is that? All right. Hold on, hold on. Here, there it is. So then we get into the spinal nerve, which is a mixed nerve. Remember in the last chapter we talked about sensory nerve or motor nerve or mixed nerves. Most nerves that we feel like the funny bone, all that stuff, those are mixed nerves. Uh, but once we get into the spinal column on the bony end, and this is about where the hole is, the inner vertebral foramen, and we reach inward, then we split. And at that point, the split is either motor or sensory. And the one in the front, the ventral root, uh, or also anterior, if you look at newer texts, that's only motor nerve fibers at that point. And in the back end, we're only going to have sensory nerve fibers there. So everybody get that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Number five. The nerve roots on the posterior dorsal side swell up a bit before entering the cord. Those swellings are many neuron cell bodies grouped together. That way they provide protection for one another. What are those swellings called? Dorsal root guardian. Woo, well, I give three. Who was all of that? <laughs> Jessica. Good. Who else? Ebony, I heard. Jessica. Yeah, got you. Who else? Oh, good. Oh, wait. That's a, so everybody got that? That's the dorsal roots. That was a lot of voices. So the dorsal root ganglion is right here. So on the sensory side, when we talked about the neural fundamentals, we talked about some of the way that they look. We have multipolar neurons, bipolars, and then pseudo unipolar neurons. So this is where all those pseudo unipolar neurons are. They're all um, in the sensory arm, which is the information coming in from your skin receptors, from your pain receptors, temperature, pressure, all that sort of stuff. And the neuron cell bodies are all located right here, nicely protected from the bone, not out in the periphery where they can get squished. And, um, and that's why there is a swelling right here. <clears throat> and when we look at the anatomy stuff, we can see that swelling, and that's called the dorsal root ganglion. Remember, a ganglion or is, a, is the, the term ganglion means collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. The no, term nuclei means a collection of cell body in the central nervous system. All right? No... Questions, I move on to question six. Looking at a cross section of the spinal cord, we find a reverse order of white and gray matter than found in the brain. In the spinal cord, the white matter, which are myelinated nerve fibers traveling up and down the cord, are on the outside, whereas the nerve cell bodies that provide the integration lie centrally in the gray matter looking tissue, in the grayer looking tissue. The gray matter shape sort of resembles a butterfly. It has <laughs> swelling <laughs> horns arising from the front side and back carrying neural cell bodies belonging either to the motor sensor autonomic part of the nervous system. In which horn do we find the somatic motor nuclei? Anterior ventral horn. Anterior ventral horn as Marcella, right? Right. I just put uh, ventral. <laughs> Oh, All right, so we have somebody's on. Make sure everybody's off. So we have these different horns here. We have the, the, um, uh, the anterior and the posterior horn. Where's, where are the horns? Here are the horns. So the, the gray matter, the white matter. Posterior horn is, there we go. There we go. Dorsal horn or posterior horn, ventral horn, anterior horn, and then the lateral horn. Lateral horn is mostly autonomic stuff. So when you see this autonomic nervous system stuff, you think of fight or flight. You think of automatic stuff in the body. When you think of uh, uh, the front or the back, in the back, uh, in the in the back, you think of of, of information coming in that we then perceive as touch or temperature or something like that, and in the front. You think of information going out like mostly to the muscles, uh, <clears throat> also to the glands, but mostly to the muscles as in we're moving our body around or we do posture with it. All right, so those are the horns. And then around everything else, 
around here, the white matter, that's just basically then going to be tracks going up and down. See here, all these different tracks that are all laid out. There's like a map. It's kind of like then it comes to electricity cables and you figure out what cable goes to what place. And that's basically them figuring out that stuff. Oh, uh, let's see. I don't think... I don't, I don't think... Hello. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, everybody need to be on mute. Thank you. The outer layer of the spinal cord is white matter made up of nerve tracks. Inside of them are nerve fibers traveling up and down the cord. Those fibers make up pathways of multiple neurons that connect the brain with the respective peripheral pa uh, target or receptors. How many neurons are in a motor pathway? I don't know. Two. Who? Is it two? One. It's probably Who spoke first? Nadiri. Nadiri, what are you saying, Nadiri? Uh, one. Yeah, no. Oh, what? Next. Ayana. Ayana. Me too. Ayana, two. what do you say? I said two. Yeah, that's perfect. Ayana. Hey, did I, I put, put two you? and it said it was wrong. I had yeah. to put one. <laughs> one. And oh, did you say, who, wait, who said it was wrong? Kirsty? Yeah. In the, te in the quiz, it was that way? I and it was wrong. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. Sure, that I make wrong. sure you check that. Can you stay after class? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I made sure I got that covered and not wrong. But it should be yeah. true. Yeah, I don't know. I that wrong. Uh, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe I, I made a mistake. I'll check after, I'll check afterwards. And um, who, who, who wants to make sure, just stay and we'll do that question first, okay? When we finish it up. Um, but it is, on this slide, we see how, no, it's not on that slide. No, here, here, here. The neural pathway which the tract consisting of a chain of two for motor and three for uh, sensory neuron pathways. So basically the sensory goes from the, wherever you pick your finger or do something with that, goes to the spinal cord. Uh, and then it has a connection from the, more or less the spinal cord level up to the thalamus. And that's the big deal. The thalamus is for all the sensory integration. And then from there, it goes to the cortex where you consciously feel what's going on. And the motor basically goes from the um, precentral gyrus down all the way down to the spinal cord level of where the muscle is that needs to be innervated. And then it goes from that level out to that muscle. And so that's why the motor pathway has two and the sensory pathway basically has three. And I discussed the, you know, these two pathways particularly because, um, you know, they encompass so much of what we do is, is the motor pathway in particular. It takes so much energy to, to just be able to walk and, and be able to balance and all of that stuff. So that's a very important pathway for the brain. And you see that in people when, when kids, when babies start to walk, their brain starts going crazy and develop. And when, when, when we get old, we can't move around anymore. Our cognitive function starts to go decline also. And so the, the walking is, is very, very important and balancing. Um, the tract and the cords are well organized. And mostly are named, and this is important, they're mostly named according to their origin and their destination. Most of the sensory fibers carrying information destined for our consciousness make a stop in the thalamus before they reach our consciousness. Which tracks carrying pain carries pain fibers into the brain? Number four. Okay. Number four. Wait, who said number four? Clearly. Clearly. Which will be what? The spinal thalamic? Right. Yeah, that's about right. The spinal thalamic. All right, Sealy. There you go. So when I look at those tracts, I go the names. This is basically all you kind of need to know, these, these few pieces here. You see, for example, here you got a spinal thalamic tract. So you know that goes from the spine to the thalamus. So that could be touch, temperature, pain, any of that kind of stuff. So that's right here. And then we got some that bring information from muscle, tendon stretch and all that sort of stuff. That's, that's um, uh, proprioception, a lot of that is. And those are spinal cerebellar tracts for example, right here. And then we got some touch. Um, and this is the proprioceptive input that travel through here. And these, look at how big they are. Those are the posterior ones, the white columns 
these are some interesting names. So I'm not going to make you study those names. They call them fasciculus, gracilis, and cuneatus. That if you do upper anatomy, you can go into those names, but we're not going to worry about that detail. Um, but most of them are named according to their destination, like again, spinal thalamic tract or spinal cerebellar tract, or cortical spinal tract is the des on one of the main descending tracts, which is basically uh, your muscle execution. So that's from the cortex to the spine. So that basically means from the precentral gyrus down to the spinal cord level, where it then goes into the muscle that you want to innervate. So that's for the tracks. Is that pretty clear in general? Yeah. Good. You just don't worry about the big words. You just make, when you see these big words and you scares the crap out of you, you just take them apart. You say cortical, cortex, on spinal, spinal. And then you start making sense of that. So that's just, if you go to bio two or so, if you don't, don't even worry about it. Just understand the concept. Um, all right. Many of the tracks that descend the spinal cord, the motor tracks are connecting the primary cortex, the forebrain to the skeletal muscle. The majority of them cross over from the left to the right and vice versa at the medulla oblongata before continuing down the spinal cord to the level of the muscle innervation, vertex synapse to a second order neuron. Along the way, the conscious wanting to move a muscle is influenced by different structures. Can you name the three listed in the slide? Choose all that apply. Cerebellum, basal ganglia, brainstem nuclei, Melissa. There you go, that's perfect. So, good, that's excellent. That's the sensory pathway. And then here are the motor pathways and here are sort of the places where we can get influenced by them over in here. So basically, if you think about it, you walk, you know, you want to walk down the street because you, I don't know, walk, walk down this, no, walk, walk through your house to turn on the light and it's nighttime and you can't see and you, you know, know where you're going. That's the consciousness talking. And then the fact that you can actually walk and it's a rhythmic motion, you kind of know where to go. That's in this basal ganglion. And then, and then all of a sudden you step on some damn Lego piece or something and you have to, you know, not fall over. And then that's the cerebellum making sure you can balance out and don't fall down. And so you can sort of think of, of, of these influencers like that. So the, the first is like, Hey, I want to move. And then it's like, Oh, moving is this. So that's an automatic thing. You, Remember when you start working on a, driving a car, you can first not really do it. And now you can do everything while you drive a car. Um, well, especially right now. Um, and, then, and then further down, we just have more automated reactions to the movement that make sure whatever we want to do uh, is successful and doesn't fall into the water. And we don't just fall down because there's a Lego piece on the floor. But those damn things are sharp. If anybody has experience with that. I have plenty. All right, number 10, something very cool that happens at the spinal cord level or hardwire feedback loop. This is where receptors such as pain temperature or stretch receptors pick up a stimulus that can be reacted to the same way every time. For example, if your temperature sensors and your finger get put uh, on fire, you want to pull away from, we want to pull it away from the heat source every single time. We don't really need to think much about that. It just happens. What do we call these automated bodily responses? Reflexes? Yes, who is that? OV. Good, good old reflexes. This is where, you know, <clears throat> oh, we got to talk about that real quick. Um, 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 lesions. So we talked about, uh, before reflexes, we talked about that, that uh, motor pathway is from the brain, from the you know, forehead down to the spinal cord level. It gets influenced, but it basically goes down to there, and then it goes out the spinal cord to wherever it goes. And so when you see, when you see a lesion, when you, a lesion means there's something wrong. A lesion means it's broken. And when you see a lesion in those in that pathway you can sort of tell is the lesion in the first neuron or in the second neuron and if it's in the first neuron then you have an upper neuron lesion it happens 
So when you have a stroke, for example, in the brain and you have those neurons be gone, then you have um, an upper neuron lesion. And that is the presentation that you get from that, where the muscles contract as much as they can. Because when you actually really go deeper in the neurology, the happening is that the, on the bottom end of the neuron, the lower neuron, the lower neuron is like a continuous reflex and it always goes and, and contracts. And the upper neuron effectively at the end of the day decreases these continuous reflexes that keep going. And so it's a little bit kind of counterintuitive to understand. But if so, the upper neuron breaks and it doesn't work anymore, then the lower neuron continuously fires to the muscles and then the stronger muscles overpower. And in a hand, the flexors in the forearm are much stronger. So the hand will bend over like that. And in the upper arm, the biceps brachialis complex are much stronger than the triceps. And so they overpower. And so when you see somebody sitting in a wheelchair and having this kind of complex like that, you, can, uh -huh. you know their upper neuron is a problem. So they might have a stroke or something like that. And also, you know, it's really painful because you just try that for a little bit. It's very, very painful to do that. And those muscles really get overworked. Um, and then, um, and so we call that a spastic paralysis because these muscles are in spasm, um, which is an involuntary muscle contraction if you really define spasm. And then the other one is when the lower limb breaks, when you break the connection between the spinal cord and the muscle itself, you get a limp uh, thing and then that muscle just don't work no more and it's just flat and they call that a flaccid paralysis so um that's kind of interesting how uh, clinically interesting you know unfortunate but clinically interesting how you can see from the outside how the inside works so that's one place where you can sort of see that all right but back to reflex so reflex are automated responses uh, that we don't have to think about um, um, and for the most part, the one that you really think about is, is this one, right? Where, do you see this? Yeah, we're on the right track here. It's this one where the, where the doctor whips your knee with a hammer and your knee pumps forward and you go like, what happened here? And it does that before your brain even, you know, then your eyes see it and you go like, what happened? Why did that happen? And then you feel it. And so the reflex basically tests uh, the integrity of a stretch receptor and then a sensory neuron, and then, and, then, and then right at the spinal cord level, an integration, and then a motor neuron right back that contracts the muscle that we stretch and relaxes the muscle that is the opposite function. So here's the quadricep contracts, the ham is relaxed. And then when we do that reflex, we know that that level of the spinal cord is intact and it works. And that's why we're doing that. Um, but it's a very rudimentary test. So yeah, if it's completely flat and gone, you know, when you, when you, when you hit somebody here, most people do go up, but it's not always that people go up. So you have to be a little bit careful and, and bring everything together and make sure you do side to side and all that stuff. And then you can see, okay, something's wrong in the situation. But that's basically how reflex works. You have a receptor, an input, an integration, an output and a target. So it's kind of like the negative feedback loop again. If you think neurology, there's a lot of that kind of input and output thing going on. Good, 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 good. And then we have some other reflexes. Like if you step, if you step on a, you know, Lego piece in order for you not to fall and the foot that steps on the piece that you step down really has the muscles contracting that step down but that hurts. And so maybe it's not a Lego piece. Maybe it's a freaking sharp knife or something. And so you want to step back and those, mu so the opposite muscles contract. So then on the opposite side of the body, the downward force of that foot needs to contract also to make sure you don't fall down. And so that's a crossed flexor, crossed extensor reflex, for example. So that gets a little more complicated. There's different integration levels of reflexes. Or then there is some reflexes like the sneezing that's like, oh, I got to sneeze, I got to sneeze, I got to sneeze, and then you got to sneeze. That's also a reflex. Uh, and that um, is more one that has to do with uh, summation. So we have to summate up a stimulus and all of a sudden the stimulus overcomes the threshold and then 
we sneeze. Or the, then we have one more that is right here is the pathological. The Babinski reflex is a very big example of that where when you are a little baby or when we are a little baby and we strike this outside of the foot, the toes curl backwards. But as soon as we learn how to walk, if you think about walking and the toes curl backwards, every time your heel hits the floor, you're not going to walk right. You're going to walk like, just try it. It's like really awkward. And so as we learn how to walk, this reflex shifts into the toes curling downward when we strike this with something that's a little ticklish, uh, like the back of a reflex hammer or something like that. Um, and, and, and then if the toes do curl backwards, at that point, it's considered a pathological reflex. So we know there's something wrong with the fundamental neural integrity of that, uh, of that person. Um, all right, does that understandable? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I haven't lost you yet. I've been talking so much. Um, it's very important to the body that nerve impulses to skeletal muscle, which move us around in the world, are well fed. Looking at a pathways from the brain to the skeletal muscles, the nerve root is most vulnerable to damage, like a disc herniation or so. Our body smarts figures, therefore, that to feed a muscle from multiple different cord levels. This way, it avoids complete muscle shutdown if one of them is impeded. Can you name the plexus? Um, can you name the plexus the nerve impulses feeding the biceps break your travel through? Brachial plexus. Dennis, brachial plexus, perfect. So for this topic, you really uh, just want you to understand the concept. Um, oh, and again. Everybody is aware. Let me make sure everybody's aware. Oh, let me do that at the end of class to go back and make sure everybody knows where the test review is. Make sure, can anybody make sure I don't forget, please? Um, but for the reflexes, what I want you to know is basically the biggest reflex. Well, reflexes are um, um, multiple nerve levels feeding into the same muscle. So they're rearrangements of nerve roots coming out of the spinal cord levels. And, and that way then from multiple levels, we can have one nerve come out at the end. And then if one breaks or one has a disc herniation, then the muscle still works, which is kind of a good thing, uh, even not fully. And so we have some coming out of the neck, but the big one going to the upper extremity is the brachial plexus. When you touch in the front of your neck, right above the clavicle, and it kind of is a little bit fiery, a little bit stingy, that might be you hitting one of these nerves that have come down through the um, scalene muscles. And then, oops, and then we have the lumbar and the sacral plexus, and we pretty much use those co combined as lumbosacral, and the big nerve that comes out of both of those is the sciatic nerve. And that's, you know, the term sciatica, um, you've probably heard of is low back pain. But it's really low back pain that goes down into the extremity because uh, co conservatively speaking, one of these levels is not working right and has a disc herniation or something like that. But often it's a butt muscle that also squeezes the muscle, so that the nerve, and so that can also give you those symptoms. So that's what you want to know about plexi. So basically nerve roots feeding into the extremities and distributing the different nerve roots so they get into one specific nerve that then feeds into a muscle. And the purpose is that, that multiple nerve levels, multiple spinal levels feed into one specific muscle. Good. The brain is enclosed by the skull and not vertebra. Therefore, spinal nerves coming out of the brain do not pass through an intervertebral or sacral foramen and are not as nicely arranged and easily identified. These cranial nerves connect the central nervous system to the head and the face. They also serve uh, the special senses. Most of them carry sensory and motor impulses, but some deal with sensory only input, with only with sensory inputs. Can you list the cranial nerves that only deal with the sensory information? Olfactory. Wait, say somebody else. Hold on, Dennis. Okay. Who else hasn't spoken? I guess we almost all went. All right, you can go, Dennis. <laughs> Olfactory. Olfactory, yep. And? Facial. I think so. That's the only one that I have. No, that's the only one. That's one. It's only Olfactory. It's only Olfactory. Hold on, let me. 
I am so, no, see, one. no, no, facial, facial is muscle expression. Oh, okay. So facial, this is, act, I'm really proud of this slide, okay? I made this. Um, oh, well, I made all these little inserts here. So this gives you pretty much all the stuff you need to know. So sensory, you got right here, one, two, so one, so it's olfactory, it's smell, off is vision, and then you got four, and that's trochlear, and that's, um, no, wait a minute. Oh, and then the only motor. So only sensory are only these, and then eight is the one that's the vestibular cochlear. And so that's the hearing and the, um, and the equilibrium. Right. So those are based, the only ones that are um, simply sensory are um, the ones that serve the special senses, basically. Um, and the other ones are, most of them are mixed and some of them are only motor and those are pretty much the ones that feed um, the, the muscles of the, um, the muscles of the eyeball. Well, number three is both, but number four, number six. And then we also have muscle of the tongue and we have a muscle of the neck, like the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid, because those muscles, the trapezius on the back going up into the head and the sternocleidomastoid come up in the front and then go to the body. So they are responsible to do a lot of the fast movements of the neck. And so that's why they also have a, a cranial nerve innervation and they're that high up and they're responsible for head. So that's about it for that. Was that all right? Okay, wait. When I tried to put the other ones, it only took olfactory. So it should be only olfactory. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It should be only olfactory. Okay. Then if you go further in the studies, this is also a cool chart. Or actually, if you don't, it doesn't matter. Because I like this because it shows you what it does. And it has either red for motor or blue for sensory. So you know, with even within a cranial nerve, you know which part goes to the motor and which part goes to the sensory. So that's kind of cool, I think. When you go to a higher anatomy, that one of the tortures is you have to memorize all these nerves. And so that's why there is a lot of attention spent to that. So if you have to go there, just go back to those visuals and then you know make sense of it as much as you can. So Professor, um... So what was the answer? Is it olfactory and hypoglossal? What was the answer? No, the just olfactory. Only olfactory. So not the hypoglossal? No, the hypoglossal is the one that goes to the neck muscles. Let me show you. Mm. The hypoglossal. Oh, wait, we could look a bit like here. The hypoglossal is here. Oh, no, not neck muscle, tongue, tongue. Glossal means tongue. Gloss means tongue. So that goes oh. to the tongue muscle, yeah. So the ones of us who, you know, speak when we're anxious, like me a lot, then that's very active. Oh, okay. All right, so that's, that's just the motor one. All right, oh, look at that, last question. As we have already seen, much of our brain works automatically out of our conscious control. Functions such as restricting or dilating vessels to send blood to specific body parts, regulating the rate and depth of breathing, increase influencing heart rate and blood pressure, enhancing in the in bubble and hitting digestion, and much more are done by the two. What the heck is this? Hold on. Two different parts of the autonomic nervous system or ANS. The sympathetic part utilizes body resources to maneuver us around in the world. It is easiest understood when fully triggered as in the case of a fight or flight response, which means fight means fighting it or flight means running away from uh, a situation. Um, the parasympathetic or the rest and digest part of uh, builds our resources back up. The two branches are physically distinct and arise from different parts of the central nervous system different parts of the cord and the brain stem. What effects uh, on the body do the parasympathetic nervous system have? The release talent increases. Jessica, yeah. huh? What? The yeah, third wait. one. Yes, the third one, peristalsis increase, perfect. Peristalsis, okay. So I actually wanted to ask the question, Miss choose all that apply, but for some reason the system didn't let me. So I chose the parasympathetic thing. But of course, it is to understand. And what I did always was memorizing these things. 
if I have to memorize it for a test. Now, for my test, you don't have to, oh, now I can do it. For my test, you don't have to memorize everything. You only have to memorize what's on the test review. And if you've not known how to get to the test review, make sure you pay attention real close right now. The test review is under, oh, under the heart module, under test three review and term list, test three review. And when you go in there and it should come up, then you get all the detailed information you need to know for the test. So you want to print that test review or at least have it PDF on your phone or whatever you want so you can access it. Because all that you need to know about today's topic Oh, where is it? Uh oh. No, I think it's on the neuron anatomy. There's somewhere in here. There's you gotta know a few things, I think. Census organ? No, you gotta know much more about census organ. So today's topic, you don't have to necessarily know that much for the eval examination. Um, but I want to make sure that you know where that stuff is that you need to know. Did everybody understand? Does everybody know that? Mm -hmm. How the test is going to work? Well, let me say this. If you don't know that, make sure you ask me so you don't study, you don't get all anxious about the final. All right? Um, what was that? So when you, what I wanted to say about this topic here is when you look at the fight or flight, uh, the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system, the easy one for me to memorize is how the sympathetic nervous system works. Because I basically visualize what do I going to do if a lion is in the corner and I got to run from it. And so I want my skeletal muscles to be really active. I want my heart rate and my respiratory rate to be really good and fast so everything gets fed with blood and a lot of oxygen i want my blood pressure to go up because i want these tissues to be profuse i want my pilot my pupils to dilate so they get as much light into as possible so i can get as much um, information in as possible i want my hairs to stand up because somewhere inside of me i'm still a cat and you know when the cat gets anxious the hair stands up and it looks bigger and so that's why that's the case. So that's still a reflex that we have from the animal world. And then I want my liver to break down as much glycogen as I can. So I get a lot of glucose, which gives me more energy, which gives me more ATP. And so those are logical things that happen when we need to, you know, make us ready for battle, so to speak, run away or fight. Um, and so that's easy for me to remember how that works. And so in a test question, I, uh, you know, I don't have it in our test because it's sort of a side topic, but in a test question, when I study for materials, I try to, you know, put on a, on a flashcard all these things. And then what I already remember, I try to make sure I don't, you know, fight myself too much. And it's just whatever makes sense is good already. And I just keep moving on and go with that flow. Um, when it comes to the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, I have, you know, a little bit less uh, a clear list of what happens, but basically the heart rate goes down, the respiratory rate goes down, and peristalsis comes up. And so digestive function goes up. So everything that helps me bring more energy back to the system and build it up and make sure I can lick my wounds and fix them up, uh, so to speak, and replenish my energy reserves, then that's what happens in the parasympathetic system. Um, unfortunately, the... Our, our world is so much sympathetically oriented. We always have these perceived threats outside that are not really even threats, but we, 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 we are so, it's so much going on in the hyper department that we are wearing out our system because over time through the hypothalamus, only living in this world will make the body wear out. And so that's one reason why, you know, calming things like a nice bath or whatever, a nice walk, or so are recommended, especially in our life that we have in a sort of urban environment. All right, good. And I think the rest of this material, you don't really, this slide just shows you that uh, from an anatomical perspective, the parasympathetic nervous system comes out from the 
brain stem and the sacral area and the sympathetic nervous system comes out from the mid spinal area. So that's all that that really shows you. And then the details are cool, but you don't need to worry about, you know, memorizing any of that. Um, and then <clears throat> this just talks about how uh, the, the autonomic nervous system is only a, is only a motor system. It's not a sensory system. It's a system that from, from our description, it's a system that integrates information and then makes sure it adapts the body to what's all coming out from many, many different places. Um, and so its motor pathway is from the lateral horn and then it goes out the spinal cord in the front and then it goes into a ganglion, not the dorsal root ganglion, which was over here in the back, but a ganglion outside in the periphery. And from there, it has another nerve then go to the uh, muscle uh, that it needs to innervate or to the effector organ. It can also be a gland, of course, uh, to then innervate. Um, and so that's just what that describes. So there's one extra step involved in this neural pathway. And then here, we even go down to the level of talking about what neurotransmitter, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, and then norepinephrine is over here. And he is norepinephrine, that's adrenaline, that's also a neurotransmitter. So um, you don't need to worry about, you know, more than understanding this slide, but it gives you pretty much all the detail that I think I ever knew to, needed to know for chiropractic school to know about this stuff. Um, in case you are interested. Good. So with that, I believe, let me get this stop sharing here. I believe we are done with the class.